Welcome back everybody. This is Eric here and we are at Moss Pawn and Guns. Holy crap, we're back at Moss for a while. I've got Ray here and Ryan. They're the gunsmiths up here at Moss. And uh, we thought this would be a really cool opportunity to take a moment and talk about um, ways to get into gunsmithing. Uh, I know that's a, a question that we get quite a lot. Uh, you know, we get emailed in from a lot of you guys and you want to know like, hey, how can I get into gunsmithing? How can I improve my ability to work on my own guns at home? Uh, some of you go as far as to say, hey, how can I get into the profession of gunsmithing, like actually pursuing it as a career and everything like that. So we're going to try to kind of break the ice and, and make some of you understand what's involved in it and everything. Uh, I guess out of all the people standing here, Ray's probably got the most experience in that uh, field in terms of being a gunsmith. But uh, how did you get started, Ray? Well, I mainly got started working in a uh, small shop not too far from where I lived. I'd ask the... Um owner of the business if I could help him behind the counter maybe sell some guns and such. We had um, a lot of business in a very small shop and I just kind of slipped into it that way. The um, guy that was the gunsmith at the store at the time um, unfortunately ran afoul of the law and because of that he ended up leaving a bunch of work that didn't get done so between myself and one of the other clerks at the store we both picked up the uh, the slack for that particular gunsmith and started learning more and more as we went and uh, just buying the tools and uh, working on things as necessary. So early on how did you find uh, was the best way to get into tooling because I know that's another question that we have a lot is people want to know like hey where where can I get like gunsmithing implements where can I get tools right uh, how did you fund that early on because I know that you know it does take a lot of specialized tools to do gunsmithing work. It does it does the um, fortunate thing was I was getting a salary working as the clerk and managing the gun store at the time so I had that income and we were also doing repairs and such so the repairs that came through we were actually able to use to buy tooling and fund the project so if you got the opportunity nearby you maybe you know hit up the stores and see if they want or need someone to help them do basic work like putting sights on, mounting scopes, things of that nature, and just volunteer your time at first and see how things go if you've got the spare time. The uh, other thing that I would highly recommend too would be to look close by at one of your local community colleges or if you're still you know in high school if you've got a um, industrial arts or technology center there you might want to consider taking a class there to learn a little bit about machine and metal work that uh, will certainly go a long way towards your career as a gunsmith. One thing that I can add to what Ray said there uh, is that if a gun store doesn't think that they need a gunsmith, they're wrong. Like it, It's not a matter of if they want a gunsmith or need a gunsmith. Trust me, they need a gunsmith. Every serious gun shop needs to have a gunsmith on duty. I mean, that's very, very important. Uh, so, Ryan, all right, you've been working under Ray here for a while, and you guys probably remember in a lot of the earlier videos, you know, Ray and I did a lot of fun things together in terms of YouTube content, and I also worked for Ray for, for quite a while. Uh, so now Ryan's working under Ray. So tell us a little bit about your perspective of getting into uh, the gun world and getting into gunsmithing, and what made you want to be a gunsmith, and how did you meet Ray? Well, in my case, I actually started as a competition shooter. Um, it was really just a hobby for me at first, uh, just working on a couple of my own things. And from there, I decided to to really pursue it as it became a passion of mine. I ended up going to Piedmont Community College up in uh, North Carolina. And they taught me a lot of the basics. I mean, I, I had a lot of time there. They start you off with a small piece of metal and tell you to light tight it, which is a, actually a pretty daunting task. But um, from there, they take you through your tools. And you actually end up making the tools that you need and going through the course and learning. And after a while, you end up graduating from tool making to gun making. And from there you have bluing projects, and then you graduate to stock making projects. Now once I started the stock making process and I started completing my projects, I actually ended up bringing them down to Ray. Um, I remember that, that was that Mauser you mm -hmm. brought in. Yep, you saw a Yugo Mauser that I uh, had rebuilt in 308 Winchester and uh, put in a custom high gloss um, mirror finish stock, and it, yeah. it turned out really nice. I actually, that was a gift. Um, for the person who's putting me through school at the time. And that being said, I mean, it, it. I guess after a while, Ray took a shine to me since I kept bothering him and I well, ended up working for him. Good quality work too, which goes a long way in the interest to continue, you know, your education and to, you know, 
try to do excellent work. So that, you know, intrigued me. Yeah, and I mean, to add on to that as well, I mean, I, I definitely did not learn everything from school. School gave me a good, solid, concrete foundation to stand upon, and really the amount that I've learned just in a, a year and a half's time with Ray has been priceless. If you can go to school and then at the same time visit shops and do work with shops, you will really create yourself a good package because there's just so many aspects that you actually have to put together into one whole package. I mean, you never stop learning. That's right. Never. Yeah, it's a daily thing. You always learn something new. Even if not every day, at least week to week, there's going to be another project that comes in that'll give you a challenge if you, uh, if you take them on. You know, you got to understand what your limitations are or your tool's limitations. And, you know, sometimes I'll take on a job that needs a new tool just because I want to learn how to do that better and also to increase the repertoire that we offer to the customers. And Absolutely. It, and never hurts to ask for help. No, it doesn't. No. If you don't know how to do it, ask for help. With the resources that are available to people these days online, you know, on our videos, on other um, YouTube channels and other institutions, you can even, um, you know, go to uh, online schools that have very good curriculum, uh, SDI, of course, uh, that we uh, have talked about before here on the channel. They've got an excellent curriculum. They have excellent instructors, and they definitely have one of the best programs as far as distance learning is a you know is a concern. But if you can get a hands-on course, you can't beat it. It's really difficult to go um, somewhere and you know not be able to put your hands on the work every day. It just really helps if you can. So look to your community colleges, um, school systems, and it doesn't have to be gunsmithing. Machine shop is an excellent uh, thing to know, and even welding, that can uh, take you a long way as far as being able to do some of the fabrication work necessary, even manufacturing your own tools so that you can save money in the long run. And it's, uh, just you can learn to be a tool and die maker, and that goes a long way. Oh, yes, it does. Because, I mean, that, that's some really specific type of machine work and a lot of different processes on mill and lathe and other things you have to learn to be able to make tools and also know about, like, hardness, properly, uh, properly hardening metal and things like that. Absolutely. So to kind of glean a little bit of my perspective on it, um, the way that I kind of got started messing around with guns is I used to buy, like, the u fixums from Century. I'd buy like the literally like thirty dollar Mosins, sure. and I'd buy a bunch of them. And hey, if I wanted to practice something like draw filing, or if I wanted to practice something like I don't know inletting a stock, or or uh, practice my glass bedding techniques, or something like that, or or pla practice bluing touch up, or just little little things like that that people can commonly do on their own. Having a you fix them, or if you go to a, a pawn shop somewhere and they got a bunch of junk guns sitting around that they'll sell you for next to nothing. There's nothing wrong with buying a fixer upper. And don't throw a lot of money at it at first. Just kind of play around with it and practice some of those techniques. Don't ruin a good gun uh, when you could ruin one that, you know, maybe nobody cares about. You Absolutely. know, there's nothing wrong with having a fixer upper. So that's kind of how I got started messing around with my own stuff. And initially, I got into gun work because I wanted to be self sufficient. I like the idea of being able to. You know, at first it, it starts out like, hey, I want to be able to push my own sights. I want to be able to, you know, maybe do a little bit of light trigger work or maybe I want to do my own uh, uh, install of certain components. Like I want to put a ghost uh, trigger kit in for a Glock or uh, I want to install these uh, springs, aftermarket springs in a Remington 700 bolt or something like that. That, you know, if you don't know what you're doing, it's easy to screw up. But with a little bit of proper tooling and just a little bit of knowledge and patience, a lot of gunsmithing jobs can be done on your own uh, and I think that these days, maybe you guys can back me up here, it seems like these days folks are really wanting to be self-sufficient and work on their own guns as much as possible. Not even from a standpoint of, oh, it's too expensive to go to the gunsmith, but because the, it's the convenience level and, and learning about the gun as they go. Like, by being able to work on your own gun, you're also learning more about your gun and you have a more intricate knowledge of operation of your firearm too. I think that another thing is as guns become a bigger hobby as the market grows, which it has exponentially since the uh, assault ban Twilight, I mean, it's one of those things where people are amassing such a vast collection that they feel like they need to save a little bit of money here and there by and knowing what they're doing. And you too, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and Legos. Yeah, Today's they are. The proliferation of the social media and the ability to, you know, basically just look on Google and figure out, hey, how do you assemble an upper or a lower on an AR-15? And you've got 
10 good videos in five minutes that you can walk through and decide which techniques and which tools work best for what you have or what skill level you're at. It really helps. It gives people the confidence to try things on their own. And uh, we see a lot of that, which I think it's fine. I'm, I'm more than happy for the uh, individual to go out there and, and give it a try because they'll, they'll find a point where they are comfortable and then beyond that they're not. And they'll bring it to us and we'll help them figure out the balance of it, you know, maybe repair a mistake or two here and there. But I think for the most part it's healthy and most people enjoy learning that and doing it themselves. They get a big sense of accomplishment by doing that. I'm going to tell you something real funny here. Uh, it's kind of a little backstory between Ray and I here. So I remember the first um, kind of mistake, like to kind of touch on that, the first mistake that I made related to guns that I brought to Ray. Do you remember what it was? Remember what I brought you? I uh, don't remember exactly. I remember you bringing me that Bingham at one point. Yes. That's the one? Yes. So, so I had uh, one of those little Squires in Bingham, like the little PPS 50s, the early X cams. You know, not the, what are they, Pumas now. They're Pumas now. But, but they were X cams. Back then they were, you know, the, the Pumas decent. are okay, but those were really great guns, they're early nice. X cams. And I took the drum apart to clean it because I shot the dang thing so much that it's had fouling and carbon, all kind of crap down in there and it wouldn't feed them properly. And I took the <coughs> drum magazine apart to try to clean it and I couldn't figure out how to get the drum magazine back together. And that was the first thing I brought to Ray. He was like, hey, can you help me assemble this drum? And he fixed it right over there on that counter. He was like, hang on, uh, and then he figured it out, you know. Yeah, it was It's just one of those things, you know, you see, the, you see different things all the time as they come through the store and you don't necessarily get experience with each and every thing that you see or don't see, but the more you do, the more experience follows over and, and you know, blends into the next job that comes in so you mm -hmm. you gain confidence the more you work on items and the more tooling that you can afford that also helps as well and also like <coughs> if you if you have a gunsmith buddy you know well and let's say that you're dropping something off to have a quick look or say he's got a minute you know sometimes it's not a bad idea to maybe if he's got time he can show you what's wrong and maybe you know you learn a little bit in the process too so sometimes gunsmiths that maybe have a little time on their hands you know, it's it's awesome to be able to glean a little bit of knowledge from somebody. Let's say you're a hobbyist and you don't necessarily uh, care too much for trying to learn all the little ins and outs, but sometimes it's neat to know like where you went wrong and you can kind of learn a little bit there too, if they're nice enough to do it. Now, a lot of times, of course, you know, it, it's just like any other type of skill. You know, you don't want to give away all your trade secrets. And, you know, gunsmithing is a, a trade kind of thing that, you know, you don't want to really give away every you don't want to, you don't want to give away the farm but it's okay if somebody's really eager and really you know wanting a little knowledge to, it's okay to pass a little something along to them you know yeah, i mean definitely. like the youtube channel think about all the videos that we've done on youtube where we discuss various gunsmithing uh measures and everything i mean we produce those videos to try to educate the populace and to try to help people who are stumped and things like that and uh, you know, Ray and I both have done a lot of gunsmithing videos and will continue to do several yes, uh, because they are a service to the YouTube community and the internet community. That body of knowledge that exists on the internet, uh, some of it may not be quite so good, let's face it. You know, anytime you're looking at something on the internet, you're gonna get some bit of bad information, but I'd like to think that we put out pretty solid gunsmithing content. Oh, yeah. um, it's interesting that you talked about um, you know, the people bringing stuff in and, and having problems and things like that. Um, it, it also touches on another thing I wanted to mention about what you said there. He was mentioning, uh, you know, kind of knowing your limitations. Uh, there's also a lot of gunsmiths out there that specialize uh, very much so in one particular field. Like you might have one guy like what, Mel Doyle, does yeah. all that bluing work and there's, that's all he does is bluing about work. It. Yeah. That's know? his main part of his business is just bluing. But yep. every, every gunsmith is going to eventually find a niche that they enjoy working on or that they're very good at. You know, I'm not a particular woodworking person, but I am very accomplished at metalwork, so that's what I focus on more. But woodworking is one of those things you do have to know the basics of repairs and, and do basic fitting work at times, but you're not going to see me sit down and, and checker a stock or hand, or, fit, <clears throat> or hand fit a whole stock to a rifle. I'll buy, a, you know, a blank that's already pre-fitted for the most part and then do the minor fitting and inletting and glass bedding from there uh, just because the wood is like I said not my forte but the metal work no but problem. knowing it's not <clears throat> is the thing though yeah you do need you wouldn't to know have it. somebody bring you a stock and then you say oh I'm gonna do this like gorgeous whatever when that's right. not your not really your, right. your thing yeah, you, you need know. to know that's your limitation you know I, 
I understand the process and how to do them. It's just not something that interests me that greatly, so I don't work on wood in a big way. I'll do your major repairs as far as cracks and breaks and things and even refit, you know, factory stocks and such, but That's right. I'm not the person you're going to come to to find, uh, give me a piece of, you know, wood that you just cut off a, you know, grandpa's oak tree that you want to have a stock made out of. That's not what I do, but Ryan, though, he's very good at that kind of yep. thing. Then you got guys like Turnbull that yeah. do all the, you know, fancy metal prep and restorations. I mean, there's mm -hmm. a lot of specialized areas. What do you have to add to that? I mean, the thing is, is like Ray says, I can build a stock. My main hiccup is time. Uh, a lot of people don't understand that when it comes to making a stock is you actually have to inlet it. It takes a lot of time to do that. And a busy gun shop like we have here at Moss, I mean, it's just something that I, I don't have the time to do it. And I, most people don't want to actually put forth the money to pay for something like that because it is truly custom work. And I mean, when it comes to that kind of stuff, you get into a whole nother bar, a ballpark of a, uh, of costs and variables that a lot of people just don't have an interest in going with at all. That's right. And that's fine. I mean, and a lot of times, I mean, going back to the whole gunsmiths willing to teach people, a lot of times, yeah, we're, we're willing to teach people what we can, especially if it saves uh, you money. I mean, but it also falls into time because we don't always have the time to do everything that we like to do either. It's always a measure of what you can output versus your skill level and how quickly you can perform the task and how effectively you can perform the task and still make money for your time. It's like like you were telling me one time about the guy you worked with on the furniture stuff. Like he did really, really good work, mm -hmm. but he was just so slow that like by the time you figured all the, the, the time factor in, right. you really weren't making, wasn't making the money, the money that you wanted to make. So you yep. still, you have to be able to perform the work, you know, rapidly and within an acceptable time frame, but then still you know, right. realize a, an amount of money. And I, I believe that kind of thing also comes with experience too, like getting better, you know. And also the same same goes with artists. I mean, people will criticize an artist for charging the money for something they were able to turn around in say 30 minutes, but how many years did it take for them to learn the ability to turn that around in 30 minutes? I mean, gunsmithing, we all start off slow. I mean, I've seen my development, for example, with uh, a couple guns that they are 15 in particular, didn't really go over in school, but it took me a couple days to become fast. Yeah, I can put together an AR in about 10, 15 minutes, but how long did it take for me to learn how to do that? You have to have an aptitude for it as well. I think that there's okay. definitely a certain type of person that has the natural aptitude for doing gun work, and I believe that you know, a, a gunsmith, let's say that like Duracoating, like we do Cerakote and Duracoat work here at Moss. Yep, I've done good. a lot of it here at Moss. He's done a good bit of Cerakote work. Ray's done Duracoat and Cerakote work. And, uh, you know, there is an art form to kind of laying out a piece and, you know, coming up with an idea that you want to, you know, there is an art form to it. And uh, I'm not calling anybody out or anything, but, you know, like, like Chad, for instance, you know, it's, it's weird because Chad's standing right in front of me, but, you know, Chad's an art major. Like, you know, he's a very artistic person. And it's crazy because, like, the other day we had man cans going out and, uh, and this guy wanted a Tyrannosaurus Rex uh, drawn on his box. And, of course, Chad just whipped out a T-Rex like it wasn't nothing, there it is. If you ask me to draw a T-Rex, I, yeah, right, no way. It'd I'll like give a you a stick, stick figure. figure. Stick figure yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but then at the same time, Chad's like, oh, well, I want you to do my Duracoat work because you have a better eye for it. And it's like, but he's an art guy. But it just, it all, it, it's, a, it's a mixture of aptitude and artistic ability. And then also the, the, the ability to kind of see the project and then make it come together. Yes. So like Duracoating guns is definitely an art form in, in itself as well, I believe, to do it you know, in a, in a really neat yeah, way. Yeah, you do. You need to see the finished product in your mind before you even start spraying anything or even laying the um, templates or, you know, stencils down. Or making templates. Or making matter. them for that matter, yeah. There's a lot of times that we end up manufacturing our own stencils or templates or even using, you know, local flora and fauna just to put down uh, good camouflage. So there's a lot of different things to um, look into when it comes to gunsmithing. It can be anything you want to make it. If you're really artistic and you like to draw detailed work and you have a lot of patience, you might think about checkering and or um, engraving. Work. Yeah, engraving. Um, whereas if you, you know, are big into working on heavy equipment, cars, things of that nature, you might be more inclined to work on the metal aspects, you know, changing barrels out and, and doing, you know, heavy work on different items versus 
sitting there and doing a meticulous job on a two inch section of metal for the next three and a half hours you know that to me that uh, that would have turned me off from gunsmithing I'm not that type of tedious um, person that can sit there for three or four hours and work on something that's not going to be end up any bigger than say the size of a matchbox when you're done three weeks later or a knife or something like that you know yeah. that's so that's definitely an aspect there is understanding like where your aptitudes lie and where your strengths and weaknesses are and then applying that to the knowledge of guns and your love for guns in a way that's going to give you the most pleasure for doing the work and give your customers the best output for what the work you're doing and really putting your your strengths where they can be the most productive so asking both of you kind of here uh you know, I know that this is very interview-like. I know we're, we always have like very natural conversations because, you know, I've, I've known Ray for years and everything like that. So for young people getting into guns, getting into gunsmithing, people that want to work on their own guns, resources that are out there. I know there's books and everything. Obviously, we, we all have read plenty of books. I, I can't tell you how many times I've read volumes from Julian Hatcher and volumes from Ed McGovern and just, all, you know, Elmer Keith and just, I know that's not really gunsmithing, but more into the shooting and everything and like, but I can't tell you how many old volumes like that that I've read, but from today's perspective, you, what do you think about the internet as a learning source? Like, I know we talked about SDI, but. Yes, the uh, internet is a great source for it. You mean, you need to look at whatever you find on the internet and, and really try to look at, say, if it's an article about gunsmithing, Look at the end of the article. Is there a bibliography there? Do they have any particular books or any sites that they cite that have the information that they're talking about? And maybe use those as, you know, to vet the information that you've gotten. If it's just a, an article that's written without any, any information at the end as to where the information came from, you might want to think about it before you use that as, as the uh, gospel. But the books that you can purchase, those generally are very well written they have a lot of information you can look at the bibliography and tell that the person that did the writing went through a lot of research to do this book so that's something that you still should consider although a lot of people these days don't like to read or don't seem to have time to read it's really really a good source of information that's why the videos go over so well because a lot of people are kind of hands-on people they like to see something happening so we're video or we're doing a video and Ray's discussing something and showing it and we're showing a project from start to finish and the completed product mm -hmm. that goes a long way because there's really no way to fake that like you start right. with one thing and you end up with another and there you are right. um, another thing that I'll mention about it I, I'm not trying to cut Ryan off but uh, reloading and gunsmithing go hand in hand too. That's one thing you, you made me think of Veryl Smith. Yes. A lot of Veryl Smith's volumes on uh, bullet casting yes. are indispensable knowledge and it's written knowledge. But I'll tell you, um, you know, really reloading and gunsmithing go hand in hand in my opinion. They do. They really do. Ryan and I were actually talking about the other day saying that the, his program, his school is, when you finish the program, one of the last things, if not the last thing, is reloading. Mm-hmm, sure is, do. yep. They go so what's your take reloading. on all that? What's your take on knowledge base? So this is going to surprise some people because I am, uh, it's an ill-kept secret, I am a millennial. Yeah, I know. <gasps> millennial. Um, so I'll, I'll be completely honest. I, I do watch a lot of the internet videos and that has helped out a lot. I'm a visual learner. Uh, but that being said, Ray has drilled into me that books are an indispensable tool. They don't go anywhere. Brownells has put together some of the best research on these things out there including a survey of price lists which it might interest people to look over and kind of get an idea of what the average price list for these kind of things are uh, they have a book series called gun or gun kinks absolutely check that out read it yep. it's a must yep, yep. But gunsmith and kinks <coughs> has got a ton of little hacks in it i think it's in its mm -hmm. fifth volume now so there's several volumes on gunsmith and kinks and also brown L's. i'm glad you mentioned them because Brownells is really like the people to buy gunsmith stuff from. They are. They Whether are. it's tooling or, you know, even just screwdriver kits or basic fasteners, they do a great job of stocking a lot of that stuff mm -hmm. and answering your questions. They, they do. Have, they have a lot of books. Uh, they have probably five pages of books in their catalog, and they constantly update that, and the books have been vetted by all of the best gunsmiths around the United States and around the world, so they keep the top quality books in in-house so you can order them direct and if you just not even sure if you want to get into gunsmithing buy three or four of the books and peruse them and and see if what you learn 
from those books is interesting. And if it's not, then maybe gunsmithing is not what you need to be doing. But just look into it. It's a very inexpensive way to help yourself decide if it's for you or not. I think that a lot of the, um, you know, the knowledge base is out there, whether it's on outlets like YouTube or well-written articles that are available for free as a reference material on the Internet or what have you, I think it almost kind of changes the way that gunsmithing is even looked at in today's society because I, I think it, you know, 30 or 40 years ago, you didn't have as readily available amount of information without really digging for it. You couldn't just hop on a Google search or read up on forums or find a YouTube video from a reputable place that had a bunch of information about it. So I think it almost changes the way that gunsmiths are approached in a way that, you know, uh, you may not have used to been comfortable with doing a minor trigger job on something or maybe uh, pushing sights or even fully disassembling a firearm. But now there's all these disassembly videos for just about anything you can think of on YouTube and well, it certainly. changes the game a little bit. So the gunsmiths out there like almost have to kind of offer that, that something a little extra that, that someone would not dream of doing on their own, you know. Oh yeah, and Ray might not want me admitting this on camera, but sometimes when we're just a little bit not sure about something, we'll go back and look at a video and that never hurts. We'll look at the di blown up diagram of a firearm to get an idea of where something may go. I mean, I'm yeah. constantly using blown up diagrams and the first time you look at them, it's going to scare you. It, it just, it looks like a mess, but you put it together over time. Yeah, especially if you have the firearm in front of you, you can look and see three-dimensionally, not just two-dimensionally on the paper, but three-dimensionally in your hand how the particular item goes together. And, um, you know, for the most part, uh, simple firearms like the Glocks, uh, 1911s, if you've got access to one of those, those are excellent tools to disassemble and reassemble just to look at the interaction between the parts and get a uh, three-dimensional view of it in your mind. If you can picture the weapon and how the interaction of the parts work together in your mind, then that's going a long way towards understanding other basic functions of all weapons in general. The um, just if you have access to the firearms, definitely learn how to take them apart and reassemble and clean them, detail clean them, not just a detail, not just a fill strip, but detail strip. And, you know, get some periodicals, get some books, uh, some videos. A number of companies manufacture videos that you can purchase either as a download, as a uh, disc, that you can watch over and over again that'll show you each and every firearms, total disassembly, and give you hints and tips about modifications, upgrades, and such, uh, just depending on what the weapons format is. And those are very, you know, informative, terribly inexpensive overall, considering the amount of information that you get from those. And the work that it takes to make them, too. Yeah, yeah. it does. It takes another, quite a bit. Another good cheat sheet, the NRA disassembly and assembly books on rifles, pistols, and revolvers. It will save your bacon. It will. Yeah, they're very handy. You know, it's funny handy. you mentioned, like, you know, taking guns apart and field stripping them all. And this is the last thing we'll hit on, because I know the video's getting a little long. I want to let everybody get back to their day and everything. But from the perspective of trigger groups, like, you know, we've been doing those SKS trigger jobs. Sure. Seems like forever now. Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. And we still do them. Sure do. I say we, like, I have a frog in my pocket. Y'all do them. But, I mean, I do them every now and then if I happen to be passing through. But Certainly. The SKS trigger group is such an awesome way to really see how the inner workings of a trigger group work. Because essentially, to some small fashion, a lot of military triggers are very similar, but they have that witness window on there where you can really see what's going on. And it's the perfect trigger group to be able to look right at it and see exactly what's going on. You can see things like you know, uh, you know positive and negative sear engagement, neutral sear engagement, all of those things just by simply using the trigger right there in your hand. And it's all one captured unit. So it's a really, really easy trigger group to explain to somebody how a trigger group operates because it's all right there and it's so easy and they even go through the process to mill a window to give you a little bit of a sight of what's going on which is really cool yes it is it's a neat one um, definitely look for used or broken firearms at your local stores and pawn shops and if you've already got a weapon just like it well you've got one that works it's in good condition get a broken one and then compare the damage to the broken one to the new one that you've got or the good one that you've got and that'll give you a good perspective on what's going on and why. And then maybe if you, if it's not beyond repair, you can repair it and then, you know, possibly sell the gun and make a little money to buy some new tools with. So yep. that's a good start. You know, buy something like you've already got, so you're already familiar with it, yet in the worst condition and 
do your best to try to repair it. Yeah. And that that would be definitely a good way to start. That's out. how I got started with the Mosins. That's yeah. exactly what I did. Mm -hmm. And all but one of my projects in school was from a junk bin. I went down to uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina, and scrummaged through pawn shops, and I even bought a junk gun from here. Yep. And there's nothing wrong with doing that. So hopefully this video imparts a little bit of knowledge and wisdom uh, from a couple of guys that are very experienced in this field. Uh, this is a question that I've been getting all the time from you guys about gunsmithing and how to get into it. So hopefully uh, that'll answer your questions. If you have any other questions, feel free to email us or comment below. We'll try to respond to some of your comments uh, or maybe call them if you have a, a specific question about maybe your gunsmith the course you took or some of Ray's services. Uh, feel free to call if you have any questions. Uh, thanks for taking a minute to talk to me. I know you guys are always busy. We always have stuff going on collectively, but it's great to be back at Moss for a while. We are going to be cutting some more videos here at Moss. So uh, thank you so much for watching today. Thanks for Moss for letting us hang out and clog the store up for a little while. And uh, we will definitely catch you guys next time. See you. Guys, have a good one. Have a good one. Doctor. Easy enough. Doctor. Doctor. <laughs> Doctor. 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 Doctor.